Hello, thank you for joining us for this evening's event. I'm Alan Bryson, one of the curators of the British Library Exhibition, Elizabeth and Mary, Royal Cousins, Rival Queens. This evening's event is a look back on Tudor Ireland's complex relationship with England. It's part of a programme of events supporting the British Library Exhibition, Elizabeth and Mary, Royal Cousins, Rival Queens, which explores the turbulent relationship between Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots. The exhibition is running until 20th February. Do get your tickets and keep an eye out for other events. We'll be taking your questions later on. You can submit your questions for the panellists using the question box below the video. Use the tabs above the video to provide the British Library with feedback on, culture, on the cultural events programme to donate to the library or else to buy the exhibition catalogue. Our chair this evening is Shafi Musadiq. He's a journalist covering British and Irish politics with a focus on race, faith, identity, frontier cultures and marginalised communities. Shafi has worked for the BBC, NBC and The Economist, among other publications, both in Britain and in mainland Europe. Many of his stories are born from the multiple identities of growing up and living in the London borough of Camden, home to 130 languages, a large contingent of Irish among them. So I'm going to hand over to Shafi now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. Thank you so much for that. Lovely to see you all. Thank you very much to all of you joining. Tonight, we have three fantastic guests for you. And we really, really hope that you're going to enjoy what they talk about. We have Professor Sparky Booker, we have Professor Sue Doran, and we have Brendan Kane, all with their different takes on Irish or specifically medieval Irish history and Queen Elizabeth I. So our first speaker tonight is Professor Sparky Booker. She is a social and cultural historian focused on late medieval Ireland. She's an assistant professor in history at the School of, uh, at the School of History and Geography at Dublin City University. Sparky has published on many aspects of late medieval Irish history, and she is the author of Cultural Exchange and Identity in Late Medieval Ireland, the English and Irish of the Four Obedient Shires. So I'll hand over to Sparky right now. Great, lovely. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shafi, for your introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with all of you uh, this evening to talk about Ireland uh, and the Tudor state. Although I feel like a bit of an imposter because as Shafi mentioned, I'm really a medieval historian. Um, so I'm going to provide some context from this earlier period that period that I study, um, but I hope it will be helpful in informing and sort of reflecting on the conversation tonight about the Tudors and, and Ireland. So uh, to do this, I need you to do a bit of time traveling with me. So back from the 16th century, uh, all the way back to the 12th century and specifically to the late 1160s. This is when the first English settlers arrived in Ireland. And they did so first as uh, mercenaries, essentially, in the company of this, this man that you can see here pictured with an ax over his shoulder. That is the exiled uh, king of the Irish kingdom of Leinster, Dermot McMurrah. He had been cast out of his kingdom, as one contemporary source puts it, by several other Irish regional provincial kings after losing to them in battle. And he didn't take it sitting down. He went to England to try to find help to regain his kingdom. King Henry II gave him permission to recruit uh, from across Henry's uh, uh, realm. And this is just what he did. Um, and McMurrah and his allies succeeded in regaining Leinster, McMurrah's uh, kingdom, but they don't stop there, right? Um, and the success of uh, uh, his uh, subjects uh, alarms Henry a little bit. He didn't trust all of them. Uh, so Henry II came to Ireland himself in 1171 to take control. And he makes uh, Irish kings and his own subjects now newly uh, established as lords in Ireland submit to him and accept 
accept him as their sort of overlord. And this is really the genesis of the English colony in Ireland that would remain in place throughout the Middle Ages, though it never managed to encompass the entire island. So there always remained some independent Irish uh, uh, regions. The reason I mention all this, even though it's 400 years before the period we're really talking about, is just to get in our minds how old, how long established the English presence in Ireland was by the 16th century, and how many centuries of history that the Tudors inherited um, when, when they came to power. Uh, another reason to mention this period uh, of the late 12th century um, is because of the influence of an author known as Gerald of Wales, also known as in, in Latin, Geraldus Cambrensis, uh, on, the, on the Tudors. Gerald wrote two popular works on Ireland. They were concerned in a large part with justifying the position of the King of England as rightful Lord of Ireland. That was one of his main uh, purposes in, in writing these works. And I've just shown you here some marginal illustrations from one of the earliest manuscripts of Gerald of Wales's works on Ireland. And I can't get into what they show exactly uh, because we don't have the time, although I'm happy to answer questions about it later. But essentially these pictures and the stories that they accompany all tried to demonstrate that the Irish were uh, barbaric, uh, were less civilized than the English, that their forms of Christian observance were improper and that they were even perhaps a bit animalistic um, and that Henry II should rightfully therefore rule over them. This way of thinking about the Irish as inferior and even the specific ways that this supposed inferiority was described echoed for hundreds of years after Gerald wrote his works in the 1180s um, and his texts were copied, translated and disseminated widely in the 15th and 16th centuries. Even when his work was not cited directly, and this is actually something Professor Kane has written about, um, the fact that Gerald often isn't named in Tudor treatises um, about Ireland, his way of speaking about the Irish and the rightness of English rule in Ireland remained a very sort of influential vocabulary in English thinking about Ireland in, in the 16th century. Um, so as I've mentioned, the English colony never extended over the entire island of Ireland and people of Irish descent remained in place in much of the colony as well as in Irish held areas of the island. Uh, and over time, these English settlers in Ireland did what settlers very often do, right? They married Irish people, they learned the Irish language, they started wearing Irish clothes. And you can just see some of these clothes here. The figure in the middle is wearing a shaggy woolen mantle. This is a kind of typical Irish garment, um, waterproof, very good for Irish uh, conditions. Um, the yellow tunic worn by the figure on the, the right is another sort of stereotypical Irish garment. English settlers in Ireland also adopted the Irish mustache, this very long, luxuriant uh, mustache you can see on some of these figures, and uh, a hairstyle known as glibs, which was like a long fringe over the eyes. Many English lords in Ireland participated in a shared elite culture with the Irish, so they employed bardic poets to write them praise poems in the Irish language, uh, Irish Brehan lawyers um, to uh, advise them on matters of Irish law. Uh, they employed Irish musicians to play at their feasts. And conversely, the reverse happens. Irish people living in the English colony um, often adopt English sounding names, fashions and, and language. Some elements in the colonial community uh, wanted to put a stop to this very extensive uh, cultural exchange. And they did so most famously uh, at a session of the Irish Parliament in, uh, in 1366. Um, and you can see the, the text here uh, of one of the most famous enactments from this Parliament, which ordered that every Englishman use the English language, be named by an English name, leaving off entirely the manner of naming used by the Irish, and that every Englishman use English customs, fashion, mode of writing, and apparel. This 1366 session of the Irish Parliament also dealt with another problem that was increasingly apparent as the Middle Ages wore on. Uh, 
hostility between the English of Ireland and the English of England. This conflict may have been caused in part by increasing cultural distance between these two uh, groups, caused in part by cultural exchange with the Irish, and this belief inherited from Gerald of Wales's time that these Irish cult customs and culture were inferior. So it was necessary for the Irish Parliament of 1366 to ban these two groups from calling each other names, ordering that no difference of allegiance shall henceforth be made between the English born in Ireland and those born in England by calling them English hob or Irish dog. Right? So you get a feel for the kinds of insults they used for each other. This increasing sense of sort of distance and occasionally even hostility between uh, the English in Ireland and those in England was expressed in other ways. So for example, Irish born people living in England, regardless of whether they came from the settler community or not, were included in the alien subsidy of 1440, a tax levied on people residing in England who had been born outside the realm. Interestingly, the Welsh were exempted from this alien subsidy, but the Irish were not. Um, and this, uh, or people born in Ireland were not. Um, the English of Ireland objected strenuously to their inclusion in the 1440 subsidy, and they weren't actually included in subsequent subsidies after uh, objecting. But I think it tells you something about how they were perceived different, as different uh, in, in England. Evidence of these sort of regional tensions, regional differences, I suppose, um, that were increasingly crystallizing between different regions of the English polity were evident in that, this letter from uh, Henry VIII to his armies in, in 1513, saying that his soldiers shouldn't uh, give reproach to each other, regardless of whether they were French, English, Northern, Welsh, or Irish. Um, this is really just a tiny little taste of the evidence we have of these regional and perhaps sort of cultural fault lines emerging in the later Middle Ages and before the Reformation. Um, but given the topic tonight, I am just gonna dip my toe into uh, the later 16th century into Elizabeth's reign um, and just look at a few items that I think show a continuation of some of these same concerns about the uh, Englishness of the English of Ireland and their sort of cultural attributes. So this is uh, a, a, an excerpt um, from a book called uh, uh, The Book of Hoth, a text called The Book of Hoth that was written by Christopher St. Lawrence, member of an established, long established settler family. When he went to court in 1562 to report on Irish affairs, Queen Elizabeth asked him if he could speak English and he was immensely insulted by this. I can't imagine that she hadn't been well briefed on exactly who he was. He had been educated in England at Lincoln's Inn. I think she's just insulting him here rather than making a, a mistake. But it's interesting that the way she chose to insult him was uh, questioning his ling linguistic proficiency in English. We also see um, some defensiveness um, uh, in the work of Richard Stanihurst, so another uh, author from uh, the English community in Ireland, born in Dublin. He tells this story about an English royal officer who went to Wexford and who was very proud of himself because in talking to the common people as he went about his business, he understood here and there, sometimes a word, other times a sentence. And he thought he would soon be fluent in Irish with such promising beginnings. The joke, of course, as Stana Hurst puts it, is that he supposed that the blunt people had prattled in Irish while all the while they jangled in English, right? So their dialect, the way that they're speaking Hiberno-English, the, the dialect of English spoken in Ireland in this period, and the accent they're using uh, is enough to convince this English royal officer that they're not speaking in English at all. But Stanahurst is also keen to defend this Hiberno-English. He says that it's an older, purer form of English, a Chaucerian English, and then he lists a bunch of words that show the supposed, the supposed um, Chaucerian pedigree, like the, uh, the idea that you call a spider an atter cop, um, which is supposedly an older uh, form. This defensiveness we sometimes see from the English of Ireland about their own Englishness is even more sort of naked, even more apparent in a list that Christopher St. Lawrence made in the Book of Hoth of traitors um, from England. Um, and he explains why he compiled it. He says, when anyone of English birth comes to Ireland, they report and brag that everyone there is a traitor 
um, affirming that there, that there was never any treason committed in England. The truth is that no country that is known ever more rebelled against their prince than England. Right? And then he has this whole long list of every traitor he's found by reading English history. So what's my point in all of this? Um, uh, different material that I've sort of introduced here. I suppose all I want to do is highlight this long and complicated history of interactions between England and the people of Ireland, meaning both English colonists as well as the Gaelic Irish, and also this growing distrust and cultural distance between the English of England and those of Ireland in the later Middle Ages. Our story of the 16th century has sometimes been dominated by discussion of religious difference and these new fault lines that arose from the events of the 16th century. But I just think it's important to uh, reflect on the way that these new fault lines were influenced by and sometimes even mapped on to these older kind of cultural tensions and divisions between the people that lived on these islands. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. And once all the speakers are done, we'll get back to you, Sparky, and we'll have a little discussion and obviously an audience Q&A at the end. So um, please keep the questions coming in from our audience. Right. So to our second speaker, Professor Sue Duran. She is Professor of Early Modern British History at the University of Oxford and a Senior Research Fellow at Jesus College and St Bennett's Hall at Oxford. She's written numerous books, including Mary, Queen of Scots, An Illustrated Life, and Elizabeth I and Her Circle. She's also edited a number of exhibition catalogues for the British Library, including the one accompanying the exhibition that we've spoken about right at the beginning, Elizabeth and Mary, Royal Cousins, Rival Queens. So I'll leave it to Sue to discuss her take on Elizabeth I, both before, during and after. Sue. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for coming. My talk is going to be about politics. I'm going to explain the legacy that Elizabeth had when she came to the throne and the problems that she encountered and some of the ways she tried to deal with the problems. Ultimately, her policy in Ireland was a failure, um, but we'll say more about that afterwards. Politically, perhaps one of the most important changes that had taken place before Elizabeth came to the throne was the transformation of the English relationship with Ireland, the political and constitutional relationship, in that it was no longer a lordship. Henry VIII became king of Ireland, and all the inhabitants of Ireland were now his subjects. This meant that Ireland was ruled directly through an English Lord Deputy. And it also meant that as far as the English were concerned, there should be one system of law, which meant there was an attack on Brehan law, the Irish law, and that all the subjects of the monarch in Ireland had rights, rights and obligations, and the rights were rights of protection, which created a real problem because Elizabeth had to protect Irish lords, particularly those uh, Irish inhabitants, particularly those who were living in the English Pale, who um, were subject to raids from their Gaelic neighbors. A policy that had been introduced in Ireland before Elizabeth came to the throne, which was to continue right the way through, was a policy which was intended to anglicize the Irish. We've heard about the cultural differences. The Tudors wanted to erase those cultural differences because they believed it would make Ireland much easier to control. And the policy that was introduced was known as surrender and regrant. And this was intended for Gaelic lords to surrender their lands to the English king, and then the lands to be regranted to them on English tenurial terms, and that they would be taking on English noble titles. So it was a, an attempt to impose on Ireland a, the kind of social hierarchy that existed in England. And the third innovation that Elizabeth inherited 
was the first of the plantations, the plantations of Latian Offaly, which began not because of a colonizing policy or ideology, but as a way of trying to deal with safeguarding the border areas of the, um, of the Pale by planting in those areas which had been subjected to raids as far as English were concerned, and um, making, as it were, garrisons and settlers there who would protect the area from the Gaelic lords who would not surrender their lands and have it regranted and would not accept this anglicization process. Now, as far as Elizabeth was concerned, and the majority of those who were advising her, Ireland was a problem. It was a problem largely because it was a security risk. There were fears of rebellions. Um, the, some of the Gaelic lords did not accept the surrender and regrant and went into a war um, against, against the English and against their English allies. But there were more serious rebellions which called upon, not very successfully, it has to be admitted, foreign support. So in particular, there were the two uh, rebellions of the Earl of Desmond in which the Spaniards were invited to come into England. Indeed, there was some small forces, only about 500, 700 men in the second Desmond rebellion. But nevertheless, when England was having a very tense relationship with the Habsburg powers um, in, in Europe who were Catholic, this um, Ireland was seen as a soft belly. It was a security risk. It was one of the back doors into England. And at the same time, this foreign intervention became incredibly dangerous when Elizabeth was actually at war against Spain after 1585. And in the last years, the last nine years of Elizabeth's reign, there was a war that was known as the Nine Years War. And it made the country a theater of the Anglo-Spanish Wars. So this was one of the main ways that Elizabeth and her Privy Councillors viewed Ireland. But there were also problems that they faced in that it was incredibly difficult to impose obedience, uh, acceptance of the crown on many of the Gaelic lords. And at the same time, it was extremely difficult to get the support of those gentlemen and gentlewomen who were living in the English Pale, the area which had been originally the colony, um, the settler colony, um, where there were the old English inhabitants, to get their support and particularly to get their support in imposing the Reformation. Because in Elizabeth's reign, there was the new attempt to Protestantize not just England, but also Ireland. Now, the attempts at solution, it should not be thought, were mainly military. In fact, Elizabeth did not want a war, and certainly not a war of conquest. That was not the preferred model for establishing royal control over Ireland. It cost far too much and was too risky. Nevertheless, the government had to fall back as they saw it on coercion and military measures as a response that they believe was necessary to raids, disobedience and risings. And the way that they tried to manage these military endeavors was limited military forays against a given enemy. The problem of geography meant that they often were unsuccessful, but nevertheless, that was that kind of limited warfare that they preferred. Because it was unsuccessful, a policy of garrisoning in key locations was also their endeavor. And this was one of the ways in which the plantation policy, the policy of, plant, of removing the Gaelic tenants uh, and, and the, um, the landlords and imposing uh, a settler class, an English, Protestant secular class in those areas, it was seen partly for security reasons. Um, and garrisons were established in those areas where there were um, plantations. And finally, as a last resort, 
where there were rebellions, the English government in Ireland resorted to scorched earth tactics, which devastated Ireland at various points, notably and most famously at the time of the Nine Years' War, where the Lord Deputy, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, Lord Mountjoy, destroyed everything in his path, whether it was cattle, crops, or people. But at the same time, there continued this assimilationist program. It took a number of different forms, but it was integral to the idea of turning Irish, Gaelic Irish, Anglo-Irish into full-blooded English people. Um, yes, of course, there was the cultural divide. Uh, and yes, there was prejudice. But initially, at least in Elizabeth's reign, there was the hope that through Protestantism, through education, the Irish lords would become anglicized and they in turn would anglicize their tenantry. This all came to nothing. Um, and there are lots of different reasons why it came to nothing. Some would say it was inevitable. The Irish problems were just too great. Others would say that Elizabeth made some quite serious mistakes. Others would say that it was a problem because they resorted too often to military uh, measures and coercion and didn't give time to allow the political programs and assimilist cultural measures to dig in deep. But whatever it was, by the time that Elizabeth died, yes, she had managed, or rather her, her Lord Deputy had managed to defeat the Irish rebels, the O'Neills and, and their allies during the Nine Years' War, but it was at a terrible cost for Ireland and ultimately Ireland could only be held down by an English settler class, which alienated even those Irish who would have liked to have been friends and supported the English government. Thank you so much for that. I've been scribbling down furiously as you're talking. So very, very excited to ask you some questions in a bit, but before I do, I'll go to our next speaker, Brendan Kane. Brendan is a professor in the departments of history and literatures, cultures and languages at the University of Connecticut. Brendan's research focuses on Irish and English relations in the early modern period, particularly as revealed through the Irish language archive. His publications include the co-edited co collection, Elizabeth I and Ireland, and the politics and culture of honour in Britain and Ireland between 1541 and 1641. Brendan currently serves as the vice president, pre president elect of the Celtic Studies Association of North America. And he's created an exciting new resource for learning early modern Irish, which hopefully we'll chat about later, if not in the presentation that he's about to give. So Brendan, fire away. Thank you so much, Shafi, and thanks so much for the opportunity to be here and to everybody who's joined us tonight. And I also want to thank Sparky and Sue, who have really sort of set the ground um, really nicely. And I'm actually in that kind of enviable position where I can just kind of sort of jump in and, and add a couple bits to this. And so that's really all I'm going to do as opposed to sort of a set narrative. I'm just going to add a couple bits to the conversation that hopefully will provide some other aspects that we can get into during the Q&A. So the first thing I just want to sort of reinforce is that the something that's already been raised is that Ireland was a composite society during the time of Elizabeth's reign. So we've already heard about the Gaelic Irish and we've heard about the Old English, who are the descendants of the Anglo Normans, um, but also that group that comes in after 1541, as Sue was saying, with the constitutional change of Ireland to a kingdom, those folks start to be designated or known as the New English, so as to draw a distinction between them and different religion, different uh, sort of interests in the state, and those who have been resident and their families have been resident for centuries. So if you look at the, looking on this slide here, though, you can see a visual representation of, if not that distinction between Gaelic Irish Old English and New English, 
but rather a status hierarchy. So you can see, you know, you know, from our perspective on the left of John Speed's map from the early 17th century, you can see um, sort of aristocrats at the top, gentry in the middle, and then the mere Irish down below. And so I think this is a really nice reminder of the complexity of Irish society. Again, whether that complexity is defined as sort of ethnic difference or sort of difference of national origin, or whether it is difference by hierarchy and status, but also reminds us of the ways in which some of those who were looking from the metropole were attempting to try to make sense of that complexity and attempting to represent it for audiences back at home. So moving on. Secondly, I just want to remind us, you know, allow us to remind ourselves that the Irish language is, um, is also an element of the complexity of English-Irish relations, which is to say that the Irish language is not ethnically determined, right? Irish language, or Gaelic, as uh, often, often is referred to, does not equal Gaelic-Irish. So as Sparky has already noted, the, you have these families who move in and they're sort of living cheek by jowl with people who were there before, the indigenous, and they intermarry, they become bilingual. And there's a, a beautiful example of this is the Nugent primer. And this is the Nugent primer named after Chris, Christopher Nugent. So one of the family of the Barons of Delvin. So this is an old English family. And this was produced, we are told, at the behest of Elizabeth herself, a request received when Nugent was a student at Cambridge University. And I think this is really a fascinating example for two reasons. One, it demonstrates um, not only Elizabeth's you know, interest in, in the language and the fact that you have a baron who is interested in matters linguistic and matters grammatical, um, but also the fact that th this is a sign of the understanding of, or at least the reputation that, you know, that would have been known by Nugent and others of Elizabeth's great learning and interest, interest in languages. So take a look and see both of the examples of that. So, so it's a short little primer. Uh, it's quite lovely, quite stark and sparse, but it gives some of the Sort of grammatical aspects of the language, and it gives some sense for the sense for the alphabet, um, but also then brief little conversational uh, sentences in Irish, in Latin, and in English. So um, now the next example that I want to show is um, it gives us a sense for the limits of the English interest and the Elizabethan interest in the Irish language. So this is the, um, the first printed Irish, the first book printed in Irish in Ireland, Shona Carning's Abdukwayagyagas Catechisma. And this is an example of the use of vernacular language for religious reform. And as, as I'm sure we all know, this is one of the key features of Protestantism. And as Sue was talking about, you know, um, proselytizing for reform and the, you know, the publication of religious tracts in the vernacular was a European-wide phenomenon of the, uh, of the Reformation. But Ireland is quite unique in this sense in that there's very little actually produced in terms of Irish reform material in the Irish language. And, and precisely for the kinds of reasons that Sue has already described about the ways in which those, those relations start to break down, political relations start to break down. Um, and in spite of the fact, as, as Sparky has already noted, this sort of bilingualism was quite common, certainly amongst the old English uh, community. And so the fact that we have very, very little printed in, in Irish, um, demonstrates the limits of, of the Crown's interest to actually try to sort of bring the Irish into sort of the reformed, um, this is nexus of, of the post break with Rome period. And what that also allows then, it allows a situation to emerge where most of the print that's going to happen in the Irish language is produced in the interest of the Counter-Reformation and produced, and produced on the continent. So we could get to see one of these splits. So again, something that wasn't inevitable, but a split. So, um, third, 
we've already heard about surrender and regret, and I think it's a really important um, uh, sort of thing to bear in mind so that we are reminded that tension between the Gaelic Irish or even the Old English and the Tudor state was by no means inevitable. Certainly there was a lot of reason why we could imagine it could grow, but it was most certainly not inevitable. And so just to add on to what Sue was saying um, about the surrender and regrant, it's, so if we can have the next slide, if it's not up, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to show quickly three pedigrees, right? So hopefully you can see some of these a bit. Um, and so this is a pedigree of one of the greatest, greatest Irish aristocratic families, or royal families, in fact. These are the O'Briens, and the O'Briens actually take, um, avail themselves of surrender and regrant and trade in the claim to be the, the, the chief of the name, right, the O'Brien, and exchange that for an English style title as the Earls of Thoman. But this is the family that claims amongst its lineage the great high king Brian Baru. Even that family has made the transition. And what's really nice about this pedigree is a traditional Irish pedigree would have been textual and now it could have come in different genres or different forms, um, but it did not have the kind of visual imagery that we associate with English heraldic tradition and certainly continental heraldic tradition. So here you see this really wonderful sort of like mapping of old material onto a new form. And if you could see it at the top, probably not, you can actually visually see the moment when the family avails of surrender and regrant because you can see written in there, it says Earl, and you can also see the little image of the Earl's coronet. Um, this is a very traditional looking one, right? It's, it's textual, uh, but this is actually a pedigree for somebody who is a I mean, not a newcomer, but somebody who has used their loyalty to the crown to be to be elevated, um, really because of the dynamics that were opened up by the relationship with uh, Ireland and the Tudor state. And this is actually for Randall MacDonald, who is a Viscount Dunluce and then Earl of Antrim. And you can see, you know, someone was born, 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 born. It goes down and down in the list. Um, but it also provides this really interesting information about relationships between the McDonald's in Ireland and in Scotland. And so again, you probably can't see this, but, but there's this really nice bits in there about, you know, when, you know, when certain members of the family are moving back and forth uh, between Ireland and England. Um, so you, anyway, so you can have a traditional pedigree for someone who is, um, you know, an upstart of, of, of by some definition. And then the third pedigree that I have is just a sign that pedigrees can also show not simply loyalty, but disloyalties. And this is a really unique pedigree. This is of the O'Neills. And as uh, we've just heard from Sue, it, it, Hugh O'Neill, who is the second Earl of Tyrone, um, leads this great sort of movement to expel the regime, right? And he is, he, he renounces his earldom, um, you know, and he sort of kind of bounces back and forth. At the end of the war, he actually takes it back on. Um, but you can see here, like with the Thomond one, you can see where they, where the family takes on surrender and regrant because boom, it says Earl and there's the Earl's coronet. But you can also see where uh, they have run afoul of the crown. So you can see the red hand of Ulster and you can see the, the, the Earl's coronet upside down. And it was kind of an eerie foreshadowing. You can see the land in that little image in which basically it's gonna say like, yes, that is now ours. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so now having looked at the pedigrees um, and thinking about, um, thinking about sort of both loyalty and resistance, I'm gonna come back to this question of the plantation. And, you know, the issue with the, you know, issue with the plantations as, you know, as Sue has, has, has brought out, and if we can go to the next slide, is that I think it's worth reminding ourselves that plantations in Ireland don't actually start because of the Reformation. They don't start with the Protestant monarch, they start with the Catholic monarch. Um, but the real plantations fall, the responsibility for those fall at the feet of Elizabeth. Right. And the great one is the Desmond, uh, you know, it's the monster plantation that comes after the Desmond rebellions that we've already heard about. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that when like serious resistance against the Elizabeth, Elizabethan regime emerges, it comes not from the Gaelic Irish, but it comes from an English identifying Earl who is connected to the families that Sparky is talking about. Right? And, but what's, you know, fascinating about it, you know, is you sort of like wipe out right, you know, the sort of population, the society of that territory, and attempt to reconstruct it. And this is a map from 
Francis Robson. Um, but look, you know, <laughs> whoever started, right? You know, uh, whether it was um, you know a, a Gaelic Irish and um, Lord, or was a you know an, an English identifying Earl, like whoever started it. Once the plantations are in process, right, it becomes a massively transformative uh, phenomenon. Um, but it also, in terms of the sort of the, the political language by which this relationship is negotiated alters radically because Desmond enters into that language, the ideology of defensive faith and defensive patria. So faith and father, fatherland ideology that is going to be picked up by Hugh O'Neill afterwards. So it's a really interesting way of thinking how Gaelic lords resisting picking up on language used by old English lords. And just to give you a sense for the scale of this thing, you know, it's about, it's the better part of 600,000 acres that are going, going forfeit to the crown. It's, this is Limerick, Kerry, Cork, most of those counties. Plan is to install about 20,000 settlers and, to, you, know, you know, as Sue said, like make it look like the south of England. Um, and we can compare that with 108 people who land in Roanoke in 1585, right? So a massive, <clears throat> pardon me, social engineering um, <clears throat> exercise. All right, next bit. Um, so if we think about, you know, Gaelic Irish or Irish speaking resistance to the crown, detention, right? What are the forms that that takes? What are the kinds of things that, that sort of produce that? We've already seen religion, but again, you know, religion can sort of go back and forth. You know, the Earl, you know, uh, O'Neill can resist the crown, but once the war is over, he can take the, you know, he can take the title back on. So I'll move on, right? So one of them is um, uh, simply culture. And increasingly over time, you start to see this language of sort of denial of or resistance to anglicization on cultural terms. And this comes out in a variety of forms. It comes out most clearly in uh, Irish in Irish bardic poetry. And there's a political reason for this in part two, because political change means that the bards who are critical political counselors are going to learn that lose their position within the hierarchy. So they have a vested interest in anglicization not occurring. But you can see this, this is a bit from a really famous poem uh, by Leisha Bacca Wards uh, called Ir Ghalakas Ghaldach, right, which is talking about two brothers and one who started to adopt English ways and one who sticks to the old ways. And as you can imagine, the good son is the one who sticks to the old ways. Um, so the culture and the political, obviously the land grab um, you know, becomes a critical feature. And what's really interesting, you know, here is that historians will tell us that, you know, Burley pretty much figures, you know, it, 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 it works out how Ireland or how England is going to relate to Ireland. But from an Irish language perspective, many commentators lay the responsibility for what happens, like the destruction of the landscape, as, as Sue was saying, firmly at the feet of Elizabeth. And this is a wonderful example from the heroic biography of Eru Rommel, um, uh, which is written by Louis Clary and O'Donnell. This is Red Hugh O'Donnell, who's the main confederate of Hugh O'Neill. In which, you know, you know, Clary says like, look, if you want to know who is behind this, th it's Elizabeth and it's not a matter of policy. It's a matter of her being offended. It's her, you know, a matter of her getting, getting upset about things. Um, and then finally, um, I just want to point out that there is a conceptual reason why there were problems between the English and the Irish, which is to say, um, Irish succession was not primogeniture, right? It didn't go from father to son. There were a whole range of male claimants who could come to the kingship or a lordship. And so the fact of a woman coming to executive authority is just a category area. It's really difficult for people to wrap their heads around. And another way to think about this is the Irish succession is, is, or the Irish, the Gaelic political system is one that has respect for the divine, right? The legitimating power of divine, right? So the Lord has to be holy, protect the church and things like that. But it's not one that works by divine right and divine right being the kind of thing that would allow one to explain why there's a woman on the throne. It just simply doesn't exist. Um, all right, so let me end then. Let us remind ourselves of what like the great Gaelic political um, sort of, you know, imaginary was into the 18th century, which is Jacobitism. Right? Tension with the monarchy did not always mean that there was going to be tension with the monarchy. And, you know, the Gaelic Irish desperately attempt to make their peace with 
and show their loyalty to the House of Stuart. And it's gonna be one of the great expressions of Irish politics and Irish mentalities up into the up into the 18th century. So this stuff is not always inevitable. And Gina Mage, let's stop there. Thank you so much, Brendan. That was terrific. Really, really fantastic. Um, I think that what's interesting from all the presentations, and they all touch on very different things, yet the one theme that struck me is that often we describe the relationship between England and Ireland as one of conflict, but it's not necessarily so. There's a lot of trust as well, and often con trust and conflict work together. Um, Sparky, I know that you kind of look at literary trends, so to speak, and the English of Ireland employ a lot of Irish poets. Um, you know, a lot of the English lords marry Irish people. Would it be fair to say the distance to Irish culture is smaller than we might imagine? And if so, how does that look like in terms of in terms of language and poetry? It's a big question, uh, I was saying, but I'll try to. Uh pull together my my thoughts on it. Um, I think that the English uh, of Ireland, which in my period is how they would tend to describe themselves, um, and they would have very vehemently asserted their Englishness. I think that they were much more immersed in Irish culture than they would admit in most of the documents that survive, essentially. Um, there's this really lovely uh, quote that the historian Robin Frame has about the impossibility of knowing how the English of Ireland felt in their unbuttoned moments, right? The medieval, there aren't medieval documents that, you know, that are like diaries or personal correspondence like the past and letters that, that survive uh, from England in the 15th century. So I think we can see a great deal of evidence from the legal material, from the corpus of bardic poetry itself, that the English of Ireland were deeply immersed in Irish literary culture. Um, but they didn't like to admit that in a lot of the other documents that I look at, things like uh, correspondence with royal administrations in, in England. Um, so, finding out I suppose what what the truth is is, is a bit diff difficult because they had a lot of vested interest in sort of asserting their Englishness uh, the whole time. I mean I think that certainly outside the pale uh, bilingualism was incredibly common and even inside the pale I think it was quite common as well um, and that's one thing that I think we really need to remember. A lot of medieval historiography has gone in the direction of accepting the idea of multilingualism Right, and not trying to say this person was a sort of first language Irish speaker or English speaker, um, or even that they only spoke two languages. A lot of medieval people spoke many languages and just spoke them in different contexts. Um, so they would have used different languages, you know, according to uh, what, what suited the particular context. There, there are some nice sort of stories about gentlemen from outside uh, uh, the pale um, in fact, from the Midlands, from, from the area where the, those first plantations were uh, implanted, um, changing their clothes when they arrived in Dublin to go to the Parliament, right? So they actually have different sets of clothes for each uh, situation, Irish ones and, and sort of English ones they bring with them. So, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I hope that answers your, your question. It's, it's fascinating because a lot of your work is obviously on more of the ordinary level of people or class and I know that you look at things like tenancy agreements and wills and how difficult is it to decipher you know large philosophical questions of identity hmm. through very ordinary documents it must be a difficult thing to do incredibly difficult but I, I can't stop trying I can't hold myself back I mean one of the things that I look at a lot is uh, naming and the reason I look at that is because people's names are recorded. Uh, you know, it's often the only bit of evidence we have for someone's existence. They might be named in a, a list of tenants on a given estate, um, and we never hear of them again. One of the things that I think is really interesting that we find in names 
among the English of Ireland is the use of Irish nicknames. Um, uh, and I often sort of descriptive nicknames um, uh, that may relate to a physical characteristic, um, describing their hair color or if they have a limp or, you know, distinctive physical things. Um, and I think this is really interesting evidence for their use of the Irish language and their kind of um, uh, the use of the Irish language by all their, their associates who presumably came up with this nickname and also just their willingness to, to be called by an Irish nickname, I think is quite telling. Um, but again, the evidence is a little bit uh, obscure. You know, you really have to, to work with it because there, there isn't anything uh, reflective where uh, someone from the English community in Ireland says, I feel like this. I am, you know, this or that. When they do make such declarations, they say that they're English because there's more in it for them to, to say that. I mean, speaking of the English, Sue, Elizabeth I is working in an atmosphere where essentially her father, her father's policies dominate, dominate the political landscape. I'm really interested to know why the English Reformation, which saw England break away from the Pope, why it didn't necessarily work in Ireland particularly? Well, it was always a top-down phenomenon. In England, when Elizabeth inherited the throne, the majority of people were Catholic. There had been a very successful restoration under Mary I. In Ireland, it was equally Catholic in its culture, in its religious belief. There was a difference, I think, in that in England, there was a Protestant core. There were universities in England. There was uh, a relationship with the continent, which wasn't true in Ireland. So Ireland was perhaps um, more isolated from Protestant trends uh, than, there, than it was in, than England was. However, it was nevertheless always going to be top down. And, there are two things that I think we can say. The first relates to the, the pale, the administrators of the pale, the, the Anglo, uh, the, what we would call the old English. Um, and it links to what you were talking about in relation to trust, because I would argue that they were increasingly distrustful of Elizabeth and alienated from her. Yet they were the ones who were going to be responsible for a large amount of the implementation of Protestantism, not in the whole area of Ireland, but certainly in the area, not just in Pale, in the Pale, but in other counties as well, Leinster, for example, uh, and elsewhere. And they were aggrieved, particularly by being excluded from much of the patronage. Um, Brendan quite rightly has talked about plantations in more depth and the fact that the old English felt that they were being excluded from the plantations. They felt that they were being excluded from uh, officials' uh, positions and that they were not being listened to. And this is an increasing phenomenon through Elizabeth's reign. And I think not being able to get their support is crucial to the failure. And many of the people on the in the pale start moving into a strongly um, Catholic position. I mean, one of the uh, rebellions um, which takes place at the same time as the Desmond Rebellion is of a gentleman of the pale, Lord Bortengrass, and, and also Delvin is involved in that as well. And they see themselves as part of a Catholic crusade. And there are others in the pale who start identifying themselves as Catholic and sending their children abroad and also harboring priests when they come to England. And when it comes outside that area where there's stronger English control, there, are, there aren't the structures. There, there is not the diocese and authority that most of the, the, uh, the bishops um, are Catholic and they for a long time in, in Ireland. And there's, as, as Brendan quite rightly said, there, there, is, there is no um, Protestant Gaelic material um, 
there's very little preaching that is occurring. So I would say the, the fundamental problem, as I see it, is that there's a political problem. And that political problem prevents that top-down reformation, which you have in England, where there is collaboration, where Catholics realize there's something they're going to get out of collaborating with the English regime. They may be waiting for better times, hoping that Mary Queen of Scots will sometimes sit on the throne. But you you in in Ireland, that kind of collaboration is very hard to acquire because of that deepening alienation, as I see it, for the people, the Anglo, um, the old English living in the pale. It's interesting because when you were talking, I wrote the word Irish problem. And as a political journalist, I've heard that word more times than I've wanted to hear in recent years. And it's it's fascinating because the complex relationship, both the problems and the hopes, I'm wondering, does it, the current ones in the past century or so, do they stem from this period or is that just a too generic statement to make? Well, I, I, think, I think they do in lots of different ways. Um, obviously the religious problem stems from this period and as the um, the Jesuits and other priests start coming in towards the end of Elizabeth's reign and build up quite a lot of momentum under the Stuarts, that is a profound division. But the plantation problem is really under James's reign because what happens under James is that O'Neill, who was defeated in, um, in the Nine Year War, but was allowed to return as um, Earl of Tyrone and, and his um, a, a fellow um, who was the Earl of Tyrconnell, they, they become increasingly, again, I'm using the word alienated. And this is by the tactics of the English martial um, administration. And in the end, they, they flee, they, they, they take flight. That's called the flight of the earls. And people are expecting them to come back um, with the Spanish army, but it, it doesn't happen. The Spaniards want peace with James I. But the outcome is that their land is confiscated. And the confiscations not only bring in English, New English, Protestant English, but also Scots. Scottish Presbyterians. And so you have the beginnings of that presence in Ulster, Northern Ireland today, of that Scottish Presbyterian, English Calvinist set of planters who become the, the landlords, the owners uh, of, the, of uh, the province. Before I get to the audience questions, um, and by the way, there's still time, so please do send some in. Um, Brendan, you talked about the mapping of old material. You've, you've done that yourself as well with a, with a resource that I've been flicking through today, um, an archive of religious poetry, love poetry. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, just sort of briefly. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about studying this period is that it is primarily done through the Irish language archive, or, sorry, the English language archive. And I mean, in a way that makes a certain amount of sense as a vast body of material that tells us about the relationship between England and Ireland in the period. Um, but there's also quite a bit of Irish language material and it exists across genres and, and, and forms. So there's all kinds of poetry, there's political poetry, love poetry, um, religious poetry, there are annals, chronicles, biographies, things of the sort. Um, and almost nobody reads them. And uh, it's, it's particularly unfortunate, I think, in this moment when there is a lot of interest to decolonize the work that we do, right? Just, you know, as scholars, um, and you hear a lot about decolonizing the archive. And this is one of those archives that, that remains <laughs> to be decolonized and, and one of the areas of study. And, um, you know, like when I came into it, I, you can tell from the accent, right? You know, <laughs> I'm an American, what do I know about this stuff? And so, you know, I got into this thinking that, well, I'm gonna be an Irish historian if I want to be one, if I, if I were gonna be a French historian or a Chinese historian, you know, I would learn the language and I would get on with business and, um, and kind of found out that that's uh, not so easily done uh, in large part because the resources for learning the language weren't available, right? So if you wanna learn old, Irish, 8th, 
ninth century, this grammar, amazing dictionary. There's, you know, there are guides on how to do it. Modern Irish is a living language um, that, you know, I'm a great um, advocate of and speaker of and teacher of and this and the like. Um, but that that bit in between is 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 really problematic because there is no grammar, no guide, and um, uh, no dictionary, no dedicated dictionary. So a bunch of us, uh, I mean, it, it, parts of it kind of sort of came out of came out of my head, but it it exists as a collaboration first um, project, and it actually is intended to work that way. So lots of people make it happen. I just happen to be one of those people. And uh, so, yeah, we wanted to make it freely available and work with publishers of editions. And so the Dublin Institute for Advanced Study, the Irish Tech Society, uh, lots of scholars and um, up and coming scholars. It's been really important for us, but we wanted to make it available to people um, free. Right, so this is sort of the beauty of digital humanity. So if you want to try your hand at learning how Keating writes, right, you know, who does the Forest Fassa, or you want to try your hand at Bardic poetry, you can go and you can click around, you can try it out. And we are about to launch a paleography uh, primer and guide and quiz, you know. Um, so I, I would encourage people to give it a shot. And just as a quick reminder of why that's important, there is a lot of material, but imagine, you know, English cultural life without access to Shakespeare or American political discourse without access to the writings of the founding fathers. You know, this is a similar situation exists in the Irish speaking um, uh, sort of universe, which is to say, again, there's you know, that stuff was written not that long ago. It's there, it's in manuscript, some of it's in print, and people don't read it. So yeah, there's there's definitely increasing interest and awareness uh right now. So fascinating, fascinating. Um I'm just gonna head to a few of the audience questions. Um and any one of you can answer this one from Lara Walsh. Uh did Margaret Beaufort play a role? in Ireland to help raise support for her son before he won the throne? <laughs> who wants to go? Who wants to take that question? It's a difficult one. Um, yeah, uh, I'll take that. Um, the answer is uh, not really. <laughs> um, there was a uh, so Ireland was quite firmly um, Yorkist for, for lots of uh, different reasons. Uh, and there are actually two Yorkist pretenders launched from Ireland after the accession of uh, Henry VII. We have um, another question. Somebody asks, what was the economic benefit of colonizing Ireland? This is a really good question. Or was it simply politics? I, well, that that's a massive question. I mean, Sue, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll say a few things. Number one, the idea was that the English crown should not bear the cost of holding Ireland. And plantation, as well as, as I've already said, being a way of maintaining security, was also a way of, of, was thought to be a way of getting um, money to the crown uh, and money for the Irish establishment, which would mean that the cost which was soaring, much to Elizabeth's alarm, um, would be kept under control and would basically the, the books would balance. It's interesting that the areas where they attempted colonization were areas which were at the time before the colonial process were rich areas. Munster was, was really a rich area um, before the rebellion uh, and, um, and that's the Desmond rebellion. And it was looked as if, I mean, one of the points that hasn't been made is that a lot of those people who are planting are adventurers. Their people are in it for profit. They're not there. Uh, some of them, I mean, are ideologically committed to colonialism. There, there is that dimension, but there is also the uh, get rich quick um, approach to some of that. Some of these 
um, adventurers had. So yeah, I think economics was important financially for the crown that it seemed to be a cheap way of holding Ireland. And for those who were going to be settling, they thought they would be making a really good profit. And it's, it was the same sort of mentality um, that was applied when Virginia was colonized. You know, the kind of propaganda that was used to get investors into Virginia and, and the land to be divided out followed the pattern of the plantations in Ireland. And, you know, people were attracted to it in part because they thought they'd be making a profit. And we see in especially Elizabeth's reign, a lot of mavericks, a lot of adventurers kind of lead the way in colonization. And we often frame these debates about, uh, you know, imperialism and colonialism through the British empire lens. But I think with Elizabeth I, I think it's more, uh, you know, it's more done, as you say, about profit rather than politics. I guess the politics comes after. Well, the politics are about control, security. The ideology is the kind of humanist, you know, we are the new Romans and we're going to civilize and, and have our own empire. And then there's the economic dimension, which, as I said, is, is to make money out of the venture. And what you have is a kind of public-private. I mean, Tony Blair's always associated with that, predates Tony Blair. These are public-private ventures. Um, and the Crown is, is deeply involved in it, but relies heavily on these private adventurers to put up the money and, uh, and to um, settle. Um, we have a question from Alex. Hope I pronounced your name correctly. Can any of the Lord's deputies appointed by Elizabeth I be said to have been successful in governing Ireland? Well, I would say no. Uh, uh, a friend of mine come in here. And there are a number of reasons why. I mean, it's a damn difficult situation. But there's also issues surrounding faction, faction in Ireland, but also faction at the royal court. And, for example, someone like Sussex is always has at his back. He was uh, the first Lord Deputy of um, Elizabeth, has at his back in court um, Leicester and Henry Sidney, who is going to replace um, Sussex. I mean, he's with Sussex in Ireland for a while, and then he goes to the court and to his brother-in-law, Leicester. They're sniping all the time. And so Sussex doesn't get the, the number of troops he wants every time he does. If there's any kind of failure, you know, he, he has to withdraw from some of the policies that he wanted to follow because he knows that he's, he's facing um, a whole group of people at the English court who are trying to bring him down. And uh, this is true, I think, with virtually all of them. Uh, Sydney is, it's, it's, try, I mean, he's imaginative. Actually, he's picking up a lot of Sussex's ideas, but ultimately he can't see them through. Brendan, did you want to chime in? I could see you. I could see you. Uh, no, say, but boy, does Sydney complain at the end of his reign because it impoverishes it, right? Mm. Um, you know, and if we move a little bit further in time, think about Wentworth. Um, you know, that, that didn't end well. And I mean, it really is an incredibly difficult job, but in part it's a difficult job that has very little to do with Ireland. I mean, obviously there are aspects of what's going on in the ground at Ireland that make it difficult, but I just would, would emphasize uh, what Sue was saying is that um, it's, you know, this is an aspect of sort of court maneuver. Right, trying to figure out the ways in which you know, you, you know, like your plan can go forward, and you can use this as a way not only to enrich yourself but also to be a patron. Right, and it's absolutely critical. And I, so you know, just back to thinking in these ways that sort of break out of binaries of, of English and Irish, or Protestant and Catholic, or you know, Gaelic and English. Um, this is a really nice way to think about the ways in which sort of the complexities of a kind of pre-modern state make it really difficult to actually do the kinds of things that um, ideologically or sort of theoretically one may wish to do in ways that aren't just like an ongoing disaster, right? So like in a way it kind of works, right? You know, it, Ireland becomes sort of anglicized by some, uh, by some definition, but it's just like uh, over the course of the Tudor and into the Stuart, 
periods, this is kind of a, a like rolling train wreck in a lot of ways. Um, and it, it's hard to imagine who's, who's the person who would have planned that. All the topics we've kind of discussed have been somewhat other about identity. I've got a question in, and it's quite a personal question from Liz Ashley. Um, Liz asks, one of uh, her ancestors, I presume, was one of those, quote, Scottish Presbyterians. I would like to find out more about this line. My mother is deeply ashamed of this heritage and pretty well refuses to talk about it. Where might I start? Well, I, I believe you're all kind of archivists in some way or another. Obviously, heritage is ancestry probably isn't your line of focus um, all the time. But is there anywhere that she could probably have a look at? Brendan, <laughs> you go on Sue, or do you want me to go? Or no, I, I, I was just, I mean, I suppose in, in many ways I need to know more. Uh, so I need to know really when, you know, when this person became a, a settler, uh, does it go right the way back to the plantations under, under James? Because there are some lists of names. So um, that, that, that might be possible. But it all depends as to when these um, these plantation, you know, the person was part of the of the plantation. I yeah, and it, and it also depends on what kind of what kind of material uh, the question asker wishes uh, to dig into. Uh, there's quite a bit of, there's quite a bit written on the Ulster plantations. Like that historiography has really ballooned in in really impressive impressive ways, um, and focus not purely on uh, the plantation itself and like those communities, but also the relationships between those communities and Scotland and also to the crown. Um, and, but then there's also um, primary material that's been made available primarily through the Irish Text Society. And so there's a really wonderful text, which is the 1622 commissions, right? So this is commissions that go in to actually, to see if the, um, uh, the conditions upon which people received plantation land in Ulster, um, those conditions were being followed. And you can read really phenomenal uh, like material across those. Um, you know, and that's, that's available. You can pick that stuff up. But I mean, the one thing that I thought about, like it, it, it just really quickly is um, if the question answer doesn't know, uh, I, yeah, I was just teaching a class in Irish history last, last semester. And I had students read two poems, one by, uh, uh, Martin at zero. Um, and, and these are both in the field, uh, field day uh, anthology of literature, it's really great. But Martin at zero is from the uh, Aran Islands and, he, and he, you know, he ends up in Dublin and he's working you know, in, uh, in an office and you know, this is after the free state, I remember it's after the Republic. And he, you know, he's writing about how he feels incredibly alien. And then John Hewitt you know, is writing about um, you know, farming in Northern, Northern Ireland. And you know, this beautiful poem called Once Alien Here and talking about how you know, he feels so rooted in the soil. And, and I think it might be worthwhile taking a look at those two poems. This is a way just kind of like emotionally I think, and kind of historically conceptually into those real, real tensions, um, you know, both like the pain, but like, you know, I think as Sparky was saying that it just like there becomes a kind of social kind of, you know, people feel a sense of identity and belonging even in, in you know, um, areas of, of, of tension. And so there's some real beauty to be found there as well. Thank you. I think that's about it from all of us. I'll hand back to Alan. I want to thank our speakers, Sparky, Sue and Brendan and our chair Shafi for a fascinating uh, event tonight. Keep an eye on the What's On pages at the British Library website for more information about events linked to the Elizabeth and Mary exhibition. You can watch past events on the British Library player. I hope you've enjoyed this evening's event. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>